What's happening everyone? Matt here on the Vinyl Head UK channel. Hope you're all doing good. Now I wanted to do something a little bit different, something I haven't really done on the channel before. And that's talk about some of the albums that basically inspired me. Some of these are some of my favourite albums, some are albums that specifically made me want to become a drummer, albums that mean something, stuff like that. So a while back, I compiled a top 10 list that I shared out on my social media pages and that, but I thought today I would bring that list to all of you guys. As I say, it's not a top 10 list of the greatest albums ever. It's just purely a, a top 10 list of albums that mean something to me for different reasons. So yeah, I wanted to share that out. See what you think. Drop me some comments. Let me know if some of these albums mean something to you. Why they mean something to you. If there's a personal reason. If they made you want to pick up a guitar, a bass, drums, want to sing. Let me know. But let's dive on in and see what we got on the list. So the first album on the list is of course by my favorite band in the entire world. This was their second album released. It was released in July of 1984. And of course, it's by Metallica and it's Ride the Lightning. Now, back in the day on CD, they used to do these compilation albums of, say, like, the greatest guitar, air guitar anthems ever. And it used to just compile all your classic songs, all the typical stuff you'd expect. And, yeah, put it onto two discs. And sort of thing you sort of gave your dad as a Father's Day present. My dad plays guitar. He loves his rock. He loves his hard rock, stuff like that. So, you know, things like that he really enjoyed. And this was back when I was, you know... 11, 12, and still very much naive and not really understanding of a lot of the bands that were on there. I hadn't heard of many bands on there. You know, I knew a few tracks, but not that many. And this was at the point where I was starting to get, you know, a little bit more into rock. The new metal wave was coming in, so it's like hearing stuff like Linkin Park and Limp Bizkit, stuff like that. But I decided to go through and listen and see what I liked. I was listening through and all of a sudden this great big bells chimed. And then du -du 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 boom ba -na 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 -na. that bass riff. Not that I knew it was bass guitar at the time, but what I did know it was heavy. Heavier than I'd ever heard before on any music a lot of my friends were listening to pop and you know stuff like that and I never heard anything like this and I listened to it and it blew my mind you know I had to go and look at the the track listing and see Metallica for whom the bow tolls and I listened to it again and again you know CD players so I could just click that button and back it went to the start of that track and you know, I nearly wore that CD out just listening to that. And as I said, I'd never heard anything so heavy in my life. Now, I had to go out to the shops and find me some Metallica. Now, you know, this was, as I say, when I was 11, 12, 13. Didn't have a job, didn't really have any money. So I had to go and buy one album. And I knew I had to get the, the album that had the most tracks on because I wanted to listen to as much Metallica as I could. This was before Spotify and iTunes and YouTube and everything like that. You just listen on CD. So I went out and I found Garage Inc. And the reason I got Garage Inc was because I had the most tracks on, you know, two disc. I didn't even know it was covers. I listened to it and it was like, hey, it's kind of different to For Whom the Bell Tolls, but I like it. And then you know, reading into it a little bit more, discovered it was a covers album. So I knew I had to then go out and get, you know, real Metallica, their own stuff. So of course I went for Ride the Lightning. 
and you know put it on and it opened with fight fire with fire and again this was back when my knowledge of rock and metal wasn't really there i didn't know much at all about it i didn't really know what thrash was so of course when fight fire with fire kicked in this was my introduction properly to thrash metal and i loved it i loved the speed i loved the intensity Again, I never heard anything like this before. It kind of opened my eyes and that's when I think I fell in love with this type of music and knew I just needed as much as I could. Listening through, for uh, we went into Ride the Lightning, For Whom the Bell Tolls, you know, tracks like Creeping Death. And then this huge, you know, 10 minute or so instrumental with the Call of Cthulhu at the end, again, I'd never heard an instrumental like this. And it blew my mind. There weren't instrumentals like this in pop music that my friends were listening to. There weren't instrumentals like this in the sort of small bits of Linkin Park and Limp Bizkit and whatever else was about at the time. So I, I never knew you could do such a, a grandiose thing as do a 10 minute instrumental. It was such a kind of ballsy move back then. I mean, this track had been around for years and years at this point already. And I was just hooked. I really was hooked. And, you know, it influenced me by wanting to become a drummer as well. Now, whether you love Lars or hate Lars as a drummer, he was very instrumental to me you know, in wanting to become a drummer and very inspiring. Now, I was I'm very much a beginner at this point and I couldn't play stuff like Fight Fire with Fire or Creeping Death or anything, but I could just about do a very basic For Whom the Bell Tolls and it was the first song that I properly could play along all the way through to. As I say, it was very simplified, but I could do it and I was just hooked. And then as I progressed, I just wanted to play along more and more with Metallica, live stuff, studio stuff. I just couldn't get enough. I put my best friend on to Metallica and the rest is history. Still my favorite band to this day. I love them. Ride the Lightning, first album on this list. So number two on the list comes from another one of my favorite bands in the entire world. A band that you've probably seen me talk a lot about, wear a lot of t-shirts and hoodies by. I love these French guys. It is called Gajira with From Mars to Sirius, released in September 2006. Now, the first track I ever heard from Gajira was The Heaviest Matter of the Universe. Super heavy, pretty intense, amazing drumming from Mario. If you've seen Gajira live, if you've heard Gajira on record, you'll know how good Mario is. Probably one of the tightest live bands you will ever see. They are just exceptionally tight as a band. Now, I heard this track, I think again, a bit like... Uh, with For Whom the Bow Tolls. The Heaviest Matter of the Universe was on a compilation record by either Kerrang! or Metal Hammer, one of those magazines. I used to get both. I used to read them religiously because um, it was a gateway to discovering new bands. Kerrang! was very instrumental in that in the beginning. And then as I got into heavier, darker, more extreme stuff, that's where Metal Hammer came into play a little bit more. And on one of those magazines, they used to put out some compilation CDs of sort of music that was in at the time, popular bands. And right near the back end of this, um, you know, there was pop punk and emo. There was this heavy track, the heaviest matter of the universe. And it just crushed everything else on that record. And again, I was like, what is this? Just so so good but kind of different to stuff I'd heard you know leading up at this point um, 2005 I was still 
you know, I discovered a lot of bands, but still treading my way through discovering more and more. And Gujira really shone out. And to this day, still, From Mars to Sirius is my favorite record. There are tracks on that that are some of the heaviest tracks I have ever heard. In all the hundreds of bands that I love, Gajira still are one of the heaviest bands with such incredible riffs, backbone, heaviest matter of the universe, flying whales, um, you know, ocean planet. And it was different with the concept, you know, they are an environmentally friendly band. They do sing about, you know, certain topics like the Amazon on the latest record and then of course stuff like Toxic Garbage Island, that huge island in the ocean just made up of rubbish and litter. And there was a concept in there with this record and this, these whales in space and just flying around, obviously flying whales is the main track We're talking about that. But, you know, this, this planet called Sirius, it was very different to stuff I was kind of used to. I was still listening to stuff that kind of sang about relationships or about, you know, new metal angst, to be about angry with the world and angry with people. And so to there hear this band way off on a different tangent was very interesting and very eye-opening. And of course, going to see them live is just an incredible experience. I've been lucky enough to see them in very tiny venues in front of, you know, 300 people right up to arenas and big festival shows. I've been lucky enough to meet them as well, which was a very cool experience. And just, you know, you go and you get these beautiful passages of music and then these bone crushingly heavy passages as well. A bit like Opeth, they can switch it like that. But honestly, just one of the tightest bands you ever see. I love this album. They have still yet to put out an album that knocks from Mars to Sirius off that top post for me. La Font Sauvage came close, but not quite there. From Mars to Sirius, second album on the list. Third album, The Godfathers of Heavy Metal, the band that created heavy metal. This album was released in September of 1970 from those working class Brummies, and that is of course Black Sabbath with Paranoid. Now, everybody in the world has probably heard the song Paranoid at least once in their life. Again, just like I was talking about earlier with those air guitar albums. It's one of those tracks that would always feature on there. All those, you know, rock compilations, everything like that. Paranoid would always be on there. And so when I started to properly delve a bit into Black Sabbath, it made sense to get the album with that on. So at least there's one track on there that I do know. And it quickly dawned on me that Black Sabbath is far, far more than just that one song, Paranoid. It's a good song, don't get me wrong, but the rest of that album, War Pigs, Electric Funeral, Hand of Doom, Fairies Wear Boots, Iron Man. I learned quickly, I got an education very quickly on the riff the power of the riff and quickly learn that Tony Iommi is the master of the riff. I grew up in the Midlands. Birmingham was half an hour, 20 minutes away or so from where I grew up. I was lucky enough to be on the edge of the birthplace of heavy metal and go and see the places that influence this dark, dark sound from this band. You know, this was real music by working class men. 
Men that grow up around the factories of Aston, earning not much, if anything at all, growing up until they took off and became one of the greatest heavy metal bands to ever walk the earth. And again, it just, it propelled me more into heavier music. And again, it was simple. I was listening to a lot of stuff that was very fast and very in your face. As I say, Thrash Metal took me on board and sort of showed me all that they had. But then at the same time, I learnt that simplicity was also heavy. You know, these riffs are quite simple. You listen to Iron Man, it's a simple riff. You listen to Electric Funeral, it's a simple riff. But by God, it's heavy. It's really, really heavy. You didn't need to play fast and 100 miles an hour to be heavy. And it was heavy that I wanted. I really did. And so opening my eyes to Sabbath, you know, I quickly went out and bought Black Sabbath, the, the self-titled debut, Master of Reality, all the stuff I could get from Sabbath. And then even when we evolved into the Dio era and we got like Heaven and Howl, still heavy. I always loved Sabbath. I got to see him luckily and thankfully with the original four, with Bill Ward while he was still with them as well. And just, you know, whether Ozzy has it or not vocally or, you know, jittery or whatever as we know him now, just seeing those songs live, I've said it before in some of my vinyl appreciation videos, the greatest, the greatest, don't argue with me on that, rhythm section of any band in music. Geezer Butler, Bill Ward, phenomenal. And then just Tony's riffs and these crazy lyrics, mainly written by Geezer whether it's dreams he had, the occult, these dark figures, or drugs, as we, of course, know Black Sabbath were famous for. But, I mean, that album I could just put on, turn right up, and never, ever get bored of. Fairies Wear Boots is one of my favourite Sabbath songs, as is Electric Funeral, as is War Pigs, and they're all on the same album. Number three on the list, Paranoid by Black Sabbath. Moving on to number four, we're sticking with a bit of a theme here. Another band that was kind of discovered from those air guitar compilation albums that my dad used to listen to. And another band I'm sure you've all heard of and I'm sure you've heard the lead track from this album. Another British band. It is Motorhead with Ace of Spades. Now again, just like Paranoid, I'm sure everybody has heard the track Ace of Spades at least once in their life. It is an exceptionally well-known track, but I'd be surprised if you've never heard. You're very definitely living under a rock if you haven't. Now again, listening through, heard this rumble of a bass leading off this track before all hell breaks loose on it. And again, just like with For Whom the Bell Tolls, I had to go back and listen to this track again. I was like, man, this is, this is so good and this raspy voice from this guy. I didn't really know who Motorhead were. I hadn't really heard of Motorhead at this point. My eyes were still being opened up to the world. And I remember going to my dad and saying, Dad, who the hell is Moahead? Well, I like him. Because, you know, I used to go to him and ask and say, you know, he knows his stuff with his music. As you've probably seen, sat down with him and had a chat about music that inspired him. Go check that one out. But, you know, I said to him, Moahead, will I like him? And he said, I don't think you will. I don't know why he said that, but he said, I don't think you'll enjoy him. But being the young, rebellious teen that I was, I was I'm going to like them. If someone tells me I'm going to not like something, I'm, I'm going to go out and try and like it. So, 
I went and checked some more Motorhead out and I was like, man, do you know what? I do like them. I'm not just saying that, I do like them. Again, it, it felt like working class music, a bit like Sabbath. Guys that, you know, had grown up in these dirty, gritty parts of England and inspired by their surroundings to go and create this music. It gelled together punk, metal, maybe even a little bit of blues in there. Some of the tracks, maybe not so much off Ace of Space, but definitely have a slight blues tinge to them. And again, it was just like nothing I'd ever heard. Love me like a reptile, shoot you in the back. We are the road crew. Ace of Spades itself. All these tracks were so just raw. Like energy to them, but raw. It wasn't polished. It wasn't shiny and beautiful production. It was nitty gritty, in your face, raw. And I really liked that. Maybe being a young kid, it was a peel of something dirty and nitty gritty. But I was drawn to it. And again, I... I knew straight away that I loved this band. Now going out and getting a whole back catalogue was an issue because as I've said I didn't have much money at the time, I was a kid and they'd released a bazillion albums but you know as I say Ace of Spades seemed a logical place to start because I knew this track and again there's tracks on there that are some of my favourites. I love We Are The Road Crew. I love Shoot You In The Back. It's just Again, an incredible album, and I was very lucky to see Motorhead at least once a year, all the way up to Lemmy's death. And it was always a great night going. My dad would be deaf after because Motorhead, Motorhead was the loudest band ever, and it was always a great time. You knew what you were going to get from the set. You could probably write the set list before you went. But it was always a great night, and I'll always hold those nights very close to me. And thank Motorhead for, you know, opening up my eyes more so into this fast, heavy, loud world of hard rock and heavy metal. Number four, Ace of Spades by Motorhead. Album number five on the list sees a slight change in pace. It's the only album on this list that isn't hard rock or metal. Now I've said before that I am a big fan of other genres. I love blues, country, stuff like that. And this is a blues album by probably one of the biggest blues artists in the world right now. Great vocalist and probably one of the greatest guitar players I've ever been fortunate to see live. And that is Joe Bonamassa with his album The Ballad of John Henry, released in February of 2009. Now, I forget in all honesty where I first heard this track. I think I stumbled across it by accident. This is when, you know, Spotify was broke through and YouTube and stuff and I think I stumbled upon it I don't know how you know what it's like with YouTube searches it leads you down a crazy rabbit hole you go to look at something and six hours later you've looked at everything the weirdest stuff and I get like that with music I go to listen to a track or something and then you know a couple hours later I've looked at time like Jesus and I've listened to about 19 different artists who I never intended to listen to but I did and I think that was kind of how I fell into finding Joe's music. The Ballad of John Henry itself, which is for Joe quite a relatively heavy track. It's not heavy in the sense of some of these artists heavy. Don't go thinking it's like a metal track or anything. But it's got a good riff on it. And I listened to it, I was like, this is quite cool. And of course my dad being a guitarist, he's big into his blues. I took it to him, I was like, check this out, and he listened and he really loved it. And he went off and listened to some Joe, some more Joe, I went off and listened to some more Joe. 
And I think definitely my dad was blown away. There's some tracks on the album. Um, Stop. Um, from the Valley. Tracks like that, Happier Times. That I think my dad really loved. Because of the guitar work. And these beautiful solos. These blues tin solos. Joe's music's progressed. We're seeing brass elements into his music more and more. Different vocalists, he's done stuff with bands like Black Country Communion, which was a super group. Glenn Hughes, for example, in that. Um, stuff with Beth Hart, who is an American female bluesy rock singer. Joe's done all sorts of stuff, but this album, still to me, is my favourite of his. It was my first introduction to him, and I loved the, the sort of heavier riffs of the Ballad of John Henry. I love the blues guitar work. I love the solos. It's an album that I felt I could drum along to. He went on to release, not long after this, an album, a live album, that was recorded at the Royal Albert Hall, which, again, to this day, is one of my favourite live albums, both watching it on DVD and having the CD version. And definitely an album I would drum along to then. It's where I started to get my swing into gear on that ride cymbal. Uh, following these blues um, passages and these blues songs. He's got a great voice as well. And I've been with my parents and friends to see Joe live. And I mean, you get two and a half, three hours of Joe Bonamassa just flawlessly playing his guitar and it blows you away for all of the metal guitarists that I've seen over the years Joe's up there and probably surpasses a lot of them with ability he is exceptional great vocalist as well he's matured as a vocalist this is a, a relatively early album he'd done a few prior to this one but still a relatively early one where I think his his voice was starting to change and become a bit more mature. There are a lot of covers on this. We even get covers of, say, Feeling Good, which I'm sure you all know. Stop is a cover. So there are a few covers, but there are some uh, tracks that are Joe's actual own material. And you'd never know the covers away from his own material. They're all strong. He has a really good way of working the covers into his own and adding that blues tinge and those beautiful solos. But this was a real departure from me. This was probably the first time that I really got into an artist that was away from rock and metal. I pigeonholed myself into the rock and metal world and everything else was, no, I don't wanna know, it's metal or nothing, you know? That metal elitist attitude, but my eyes were opened and I learned very quickly that I could like music that wasn't rock and metal and Joe was the first one to show me that and that opened me up more to more blues country music coming in as well and you know what it was cool to like stuff that wasn't rock and metal music didn't stop at rock and metal there was far much far more than I realized out there which became a problem a good problem because it suddenly meant I had loads more to go and experience and go and research and check out. But, you know, Joe churns album after album out. He's fantastic. If you've never heard of him or you're not sure, go and check it out. Go and check this album out. I really don't think that you will be disappointed. So that is The Ballad of John Henry by Joe Bonamassa. Number six. Probably the most modern release on this list. The band that I've talked about on some of my download memory series videos. A band that is exceptional live. I genuinely get excited when I talk about this band live just because of how good they are. And that is every time I die with Low Teens, released in September of 16, so definitely probably the most modern release on this list. 
when you look at when the other albums release. But I listened to Every Time I Die quite a bit up to this point. Seen them live a few times, blew my mind away every time. But then they dropped Low Teens and it was a game changer. This band had released the best album of their career. And if you weren't ever sure on Every Time I Die before, you had to be sure on them with low teams. Glitches, the coin has a say. I mean, the coin has a say just is flawless. The whole album is flawless. I couldn't even pick certain tracks out to say they're flawless because all of it is flawless. You kick the album off with this sort of slower tempo put in your face track that then goes into what you would expect we're going to glitches and it is what you expect i've got to hear some of these tracks live and they sound even bigger live and it is just the perfect album a new album is coming soon they've just announced it it's going to be dropping before the end of the year i hope it lives up to the standard that they set on low teams. It's frantic, it's breathless, it leaves you wanting more. It's a fairly long record, like 15, 16 tracks on it. But it's so heavy, the breakdowns on it, the riffs, there's so many riffs. Keith Buckley's lyrics are just as crazy as ever, but brilliant at the same time. An incredible lyricist is that man, that band just, as I say, the riffs, monstrous. And as much as I loved Every Time I Die before, this album just didn't leave my headphones and anything I was playing music on for weeks. You know, I don't really listen to CDs in my car anymore, it's all done through Apple. Low Teens does not leave my car. And that will be played on CDs, but the only CD I have left in my car. It stays in there because it gets played still. What an album. Go and see these guys live. They'll be coming back to the UK, Europe, America, wherever you live. Go and see these guys because it is one of the best live shows with the intensity that you will ever see. That's the next one on the list, every time I die, low teens. Album number seven on the list is by a band that I've kind of been a bit hit and miss with over the years. But when I heard this album, wow, it was the heaviest album I think that this band had put up to at this point. And it opened my eyes further. Especially from a drummer who was wanting to just expand as much as he can. This album introduced me to a whole lot of crazy time signatures. I love a crazy time signature. And this album, this band full stop, has plenty of them. And that's Dream Theater dropping Train of Four. November 2003 was when this album came out. And yeah, this was riff crazy. I definitely think it was the heaviest record at this point that the band had put out. I'd not... I'd heard a bit of Dream Theatre, but this was the first album that really took me in. And from there, went out onto other albums. Never had the same impact on me. Some of the albums I just not really crazy on at all. But Train of Thought, for me, is solid. There's some really heavy tracks on there, and... It was an album that pushed me to be a better drummer. I used to love playing along to records. As a kid, I'd have my drum lessons and learn the theory and everything and techniques and whatnot, but there was nothing better than putting an album on and playing along to it on my drums and pretending I was the drummer for that band playing in front of this huge crowd. But Train of Thought really did push me and made me a better drummer, I feel. It was a very inspirational album. You know, Mike Portnoy is still one of my favourite drummers. I was very sad when he left 
Dream Theater. I don't think I've ever got on board as much with Mike Mangini. Not to say he's a bad drummer, but Mike Portnoy for me was just solid. I loved watching his DVDs, his YouTube stuff. I ordered, because Mike used to put out um, the albums on DVD of him playing drums through the whole album. And I ordered Trainer 4, and it came, and it was even signed by Mike Portnoy on it. Which I've still got that package somewhere with his autograph on. That was for a, a young guy in his teens. That was major. Very exciting. And I would, I would play, there were certain tracks that I would focus on, as I am. Endless Sacrifice, Honor Thy Father. I mean, the intro for Honor Thy Father used to blow my mind trying to recreate that itself. I always used to play nowhere near to the standard or the level of my Portnoy. Mine would always be a simplified version, but I would work and work to nail those time signatures. So even if it was a simplified version of the songs, just to nail those time signatures was a big deal for me. And then as I went into bands and, you know, got myself into playing with bands, I would always like to bring a different element and encourage a little bit of time signature change away from 4-4. And that was always down to this album and to Dream Theatre. I've seen Dream Theatre live a few times and my favourite parts of the set are always the tracks off Train of Four. Octavarium followed, and again, that was another album I liked. Not as much, but again, those two albums, anything live, off those albums that I hear when I see them, I really enjoy. And yeah, I don't think they've ever released an album as heavy as Train of Four since, which is a shame because they showed that they can be a really great heavy prog band. But uh, yeah, just. I would have the best time playing along to this album on the drums and I really do think it improved me and taught me a lot more because everything I was playing was really 4-4 four, four. and suddenly there wasn't a lot of 4-4 four, four in this music but that's the next one on the list, Dream Fear, Train of Thought. Number 8 now on the list is an album that propelled this band very much into the spotlight, especially with the track Blood and Thunder. And this, of course, is Mastodon with the monster that is Leviathan. Probably my first introduction to concept albums as well. This was loosely based on Moby Dick. And this was released in August of 2004, a stage in my life where I was breaking away from the big bands. Because when I, you know, got into heavier music, as I've already discussed, a lot of the bands were the bands that you kind of expect to know. Metallica, Motorhead, Black Sabbath, bands like that. Mastodon were on that same level and same radar as being as well known as some of these bands. But I heard Blood and Thunder, it was getting a lot of sort of airtime on music channels and on rock radio, stuff like that. And again, it was the drumming, I think, mainly that drew me in. And then I bought this album and it was probably one of my most worn CDs because this would constantly be played. I was in sixth form at the time and I had a little portable CD player. I'm sure you remember the ones I'm talking about. One that you try and find a pocket big enough to shove it in. It usually fit well in your coat pocket, but if you didn't have a coat on or a hoodie, you'd probably have issues. You'd have to carry it in your hand. This was back before iPods and stuff really sort of got going. And Leviathan would live in that CD player when I was at sixth form. And all day long, in lessons, when I was in the library, when I was hanging out with my friends, I'd be playing Leviathan. That memory, or well, that the album was just ingrained in my memory. And I would talk to anybody that would listen about this. It didn't matter if you like rock and metal, or if you hated it. I was telling you about Leviathan by Mastodon. And again, 
I talk about drums a lot, but it's an album that really inspired me. Again, it was a simplistic version, but I would try and go toe to toe with Brandela. Usually not very successfully, because it was just these fills, 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 fills. I think that's what, again, an album, I talked about Train of Thought, it improved me as a drummer with time signatures. I think Leviathan improved me with fills because Brandela was full of them and these tracks were full of them. And as I say, it was very interesting because it was a, a concept album as such, you know, as I say, loosely based on Moby Dick. So there was a story to tell. And I love albums that you put it on and start, you get through to the end and a story has been told. Now that's not just a lyrical front where it's telling a tale through the lyrics through each of the tracks, but a musical story as well. The highs and the lows of the album, the tempo changes, the heavier, the slower, softer passages. I love albums that tell these stories. And this was an album that I think made pretty much every album of the year list as number one in terms of rock and metal. This album was huge. Remission was before this, which was a, a great album in its own right, but it didn't propel the band quite like Leviathan did. And suddenly they were starting to tour more. They were starting to get support slots. The first time I saw them, they played about a 20 minute set. And that was the opening band on a bill that then had Hatebreed, Slayer and Slipknot. That was a pretty big tour to be getting themselves on. And it may have only been 20 minutes, but what 20 minutes it was. And then I was lucky enough to start seeing them on their own tours when they were still playing small venues. Again, another band that I was lucky enough to get to meet. And yes, they've gone in a very proggy direction now. We haven't got quite the heaviness that we saw on Remission and even Leviathan. And they have gone in a very proggy direction. But still a great band that churns out great music. It's a band my dad has been lucky enough to see. We saw them open for the Mighty Tall. And that was a great experience. A lot of tracks off Leviathan, which always keeps me happy. Again, a bit like when I see Dream Theater and they play anything off Train of Four. When I see Mastodon and they play anything off Leviathan, it's so ground into my my brain and my memory, but I love those moments in the set, hearing these songs live, being able to tune my vision into Brandela and watch him play these tracks that I would play hundreds of times on my drum kit live in front of me, seeing if I was anywhere close to matching what he was playing. Probably not is mostly the case, but damn it, I had fun doing it in the process. So the next album, that's number eight on the list. Mastodon, Leviathan. Number nine, the penultimate album on this list. Now, I describe this album like this, okay? If aliens ever came down from our space, and they came up to me, they said, Matt, what is heavy metal? Describe heavy metal. We hear these humans talking about it, but we don't know what it is. Describe it, play me some heavy metal. This album would be the album I put on to describe what heavy metal is best. And that is Painkiller by Judas Priest, released in September of 1990. Metal for me, the vocals, the guitar solos, the riffs, the thunderous drums, these incredible bass lines. I think Painkiller has all of them. From start to finish, it is the most heavy metal album you could possibly get. You know, on the title track, on the opening track of Painkiller. Rob's vocals, that high register that he gets, that he still pulls off now. The solos throughout that track, the riffs, 
the kick drum just going the whole way through, hearing that bass guitar just thundering underneath. It is just pure heavy metal. There is nothing that is more metal than Painkiller, the track, and then the following album. Like, you know, even when you see them and they're in the leather, it's just metal. Everything about it is pure heavy metal. Nothing else comes close at times than this record. You go through the rest of it. Leather Rebel, Metal Meltdown, A Touch of Evil, the riffs, the solos, again. Pure metal. And they weren't always like that. You know, you listen to earlier Priest. We're going back to the 70s. This is a band that has been around for 50 years now. Another band from Birmingham, just like Sabbath. Lucky enough, as I say, to grow up just outside Birmingham and see the sights and the sounds that shaped Judas Priest, shaped Black Sabbath, shaped Napalm Death, bands like that. And early on, it was, again, very working class music. Hearing Rob Halford sing about Birmingham, even on his solo stuff, you've listened to Halford on his solo stuff, singing about Birmingham, singing about the black country and about the Midlands. And that came through in the music. Now this album steps away from that. This is a bit late, you know, look, 20 odd years into their career at this point that this album came out. So we came away from that sort of middle class sound. This is quite polished. But, you know, I, I literally can't stress enough, this is pure heavy metal. This is what heavy metal, for me, stereotypically sounds like. And yeah, heavy metal is a vast big thing now that encompasses so, so much. Metal is huge. And the amount of subgenres that you get now is ridiculous. You know, but if you're looking for what heavy metal to me, and I'm sure many others will sound like, it is this album. The solos you could air guitar to all day, the drums just thundering away, playing along to the riffs. I'm never gonna try and sing like Rob Halford, I've blown my voice out, especially on the title track. But this is heavy metal. This is what those aliens need to hear. If you come in from the, the past, if they, create time travel and someone comes back from the past a caveman you sit him in front of some speakers get a vinyl because it will sound better put painkiller on and watch their faces mount number nine on the list judas priest pain killer and so we get to number 10 the last album on this list Last but by no means least, the second album by the Iowa Nine, and that of course is Slipknot with Iowa, released in August of 2001. Slipknot were making waves, their image, the fact there was nine of them. The first record was getting people talking, but that second record, Iowa, Man, it just blew them into mega leagues. It really did. It's an album that I have fond memories of my teenage years when I was at school. My very best friend, Andy, who I've mentioned before in my download videos. I remember uh, being in sixth form and I would have free periods or lunch or whatever. Andy didn't come to sixth form with us. Uh, he was doing college, but I'd come round to Andy's house during free periods and his family would be out at school or at work or whatever. And we had the Disaster Pieces DVD, or Andy had the Disaster Pieces DVD, he's a big Slipknot fan. And we would put that on, turn that volume up as loud as we could get it so that literally the dust was coming down from the bricks of the house. The house was shaking. And we were just 
jump around his lounge, jump over the couches, just have a mini two-person mosh pit and love every second. You go back to school, feel like you've had a the hugest workout, sweaty and your neck aching and your back aching. But we did it all the time and it was incredible. We loved every second of it. They'd open on the set with people equal shit. Which of course, we'd get on Iowa. We'd just break our necks from that second and it would carry through. That DVD show was very heavy on the Iowa set. So, of course, it was the, the latest album out. And we would just love every second. We got to see Slipknot live. We saw them together a few times. And again, we would just go crazy. I remember a show that I actually mentioned earlier with Mastodon, Hatebreed, Slayer, and Slipknot. Slipknot were on last. We didn't, we weren't standing. We were in the, like the, the side, the front row of the seats. And people, a lot of people were still sitting during all of these bands, which blows my mind anyway, how you could sit to watch these bands and just not even nod your head or anything. But I remember Andy and I stood at the very front with barriers in front of us and jumping so high we near enough flew over the barrier down into the pit. We were going for it. We were like 16 at the time, 17, loving every second. And of course, that is why this album means a lot to me. It brings back such great memories of blasting out, slipping up around each other's houses, going to the gigs together. And again, coming back to drumming, it's very much an album that pushed me. Again, a simplified version of what Joey Jordison was doing. But another album that I think helped me very much as a drummer. Train of Thought helped my time signatures. Leviathan helped my fills. Iowa helped my double pedal work. Hearing Joey Jordison playing these insane double pedal paths parts, you know, heretic anthem, stuff like that, even on People Equal Shit, Disaster Piece, all the way through the album, I wanted to match Joey Jordison on that speed, which served me well, it really did, it really improved my double pedal work, trying to match the intensity and speed, and I got really great with my pedal work, really fast I felt. And then I'd watch Joey play on clips on YouTube or when I see him live, I was like, you know what, I'm nowhere near. I am nowhere near that level. But again, it, it pushed me in the right direction, drumming wise and musically wise. It was a massive album. And of course, everyone would speak about Slipknot, whether you liked them or not. They were very controversial. The masks, like I said, there were nine of them the content of the lyrics, what they were doing, what they would do during their live shows. Everyone would talk about it, whether positive, negative, whatever. But I loved it. We loved it. And even seeing the band now who have, you know, matured, you don't quite get the stage antics anymore. But just again, hearing the tracks off Iowa live even now, takes me straight back to those amazing memories from when I was a teenager, bouncing around Andy's lounge, crashing into walls, knocking vases and lights over. The best times. And that rounds up this list of 10 albums that hugely inspired me, that I love very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, drop me some comments. Let me know if you agree. Let me know your own albums that bring back memories for you, that inspired you, that you love to this day, whether you became a musician because of these albums, let me know, drop me some comments. Don't forget as always to subscribe, hit the bell for all notifications, go and smash that like button. Plenty more videos coming up for you guys. Thank you again for checking this one out, taking a bit of a trip down a musical memory lane. I'm Matt, this is the Vinyl Head UK channel. And of course, I will catch you guys real soon.